Welcome back, everybody, to Cool Times Podcast. We talk all things cool about the cold storage construction industry. We got the uh, the main host over here, Jenna Free. Uh, I am Vince Free, and we have an awesome, badass guest today over from BGO and, uh, you know, from the money side, which we all talk about all the time. And uh, our boy, Will Nelson, who is the principal investment and portfolio manager, cold storage. You have a very long, bigger title than that, Will, but I will let you introduce yourself and BGO and let us know what BGO stands for, what you do. Tell us all about you, Will. Welcome to the show, bro. Welcome. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Vince and Jenna, really appreciate you having me. Yeah, Will Nelson, BGO. So BGO, 30 seconds is a high level. It's a global investment manager. We invest on behalf of pensions and institutions, really across the globe. Our four big regions are US, Canada, Europe, and Asia. Specific to this call, I would say we have a dedicated focus on cold storage, both here in the US, Canada, and then Europe and Asia. So we've assembled teams kind of across the globe with a focus on investing in everything from construction all the way through to stabilized operating assets, you know, with tenants in place and the like. So myself specifically, I sit in our Santa Monica office, been with the firm for about seven years. So done a variety of things within that time frame, but the last kind of three or four have really been focused on the temp control space. Started at BGO, we bought our first asset stabilized operating building actually with that Rob Adams and Sam Tittman and those boys built out in Seattle. So that was yeah. our first real, okay, we're going to buy a cold storage building. What does this mean? Mm-hmm. Right. So this was mm-hmm. probably 2017. We did that. Started spending time with them, learning a bit more about the space, did a development in, in Savannah with a group called Bridge, who's done a few projects. And that sort of, the, the light bulb started going off internally that this was something that our peer set, which is largely sort of real estate managers and investors weren't really focused on in a meaningful way. And we saw that as an opportunity given the barriers to entry and how sort of, from our perspective, complicated the asset class can be as a way to sort of differentiate ourselves. So right. we formed some dedicated teams, raised some you know dedicated capital around the strategy and and really, we've been at it for the last kind of three years in earnest and, you know, working with folks like yourselves on, I think we've got 20 or 30 projects across the U.S. in various stages wow. from construction to operating. So it's been a whirlwind, but very fun time. Wow. So you said you, you've been at BGO for seven years. Is the cold cold storage sounds like it's been like about the last three years you're saying what was the the motivation? Like, how did that, did BGO always invest in cold or or was this something new that they're like, oh, we definitely want to get into this, but, but what's the motivation behind it? Yeah, I would say it was, it was definitely something new. Um, we sort of dipped our toe in by buying, you know, a single building and then through that process learned a bit more about it. And I would say, honestly, that <laughs> the aha moment that we realized that this was something we could really focus on was we actually built a project in Savannah and in the pandemic, ultimately there were some issues with the project and we had a vacant building and within kind of 30 days, we had three different groups reaching out to lease it. And through that process, talking to those different groups, we understood that, look, there's no new supply in the industry. It's everything's traditionally built for, you know, Somebody wants to build a building, they go build a building for themselves, right? There's nobody that's building buildings for people to have optionality. And if you look at traditional dry industrial warehouses, people build them all over the country and, you know, tenants occupy them, they bid on accounts, they win new business, they grow their business. So we realized in that kind of moment that this is something that we could focus on. And then we looked at the landscape and there were just none of our peers really doing it. So opportunity to offer something differentiated to our investors and come up with a strategy that we felt on a risk adjusted basis, you know, made a lot of sense for us and, and our clients. Obviously I feel, we know there's been growth in this industry here domestically. Are you seeing that same kind of growth in your other, you know, areas that you guys are kind of specializing in? Like you're- Yeah, I'd say Canada's sort of similar to here, maybe a little bit less. Yeah. Europe, there's been a lot. I think they're very forward thinking in Europe. We actually work with our European team a lot to try and understand trends and sort of sustainability and technology and automation. I think they're always one step ahead of us, it seems like. So being able to have that is great. They're building some pretty cool projects over there. And then 
if you look at sort of the Asia Pac region, they're way behind from an infrastructure perspective where they need to be. And I think if you look at the rising middle class over there and and food security that really was highlighted and over the last challenging years that we've had, mm -hmm. they're really focused on new infrastructure over there. And they're it's uh it's really a tough region to penetrate though. So it's it's something that there's a lot of not just ourselves, I think investors focus on trying to figure out how to do things over in Asia. And and I think it will happen just because, you know, people need to eat everywhere, as we like to oh, yeah. say. Oh, yeah. They do. And they're a growing population like crazy. So yeah, definitely growth over there. When does BGO come into the equation on a project? I guess, you know, shine some light on, on BGO and how, when you get involved, what stage you get involved, what is your role within the project with the GC or the end user, or for someone that has no idea about our industry, there's yeah. going to be listeners here that are new to the industry that are trying to learn about the cold storage construction space and, you know, tell us a little bit about BGO and, and your, your involvement, where you come in, all that. Yeah, no, it's a really good question and definitely situation by situation, but at a, at a high level, I would say typically for those that don't understand how the real estate investment business works. I mean, large managers like ourselves typically partner with localized groups that bring a level of expertise we call them our development partners so mm -hmm. typically how that works is we each invest a certain amount of money we have a partnership but that local group like for example you know rob and sam adams at ti cold mm -hmm. they're responsible with managing day-to-day -day the general contractor and the delivery of the project we sit side by side with them we're a resource I think what you see with our team is as we built out our team and started to hire folks from industry, like a Mike Adkins, who's yep. been around yep. for a long time, that gives us the ability to get involved in projects sooner if, they, if we need to be. And we're starting to work a lot and we try and work a lot with end users really to partner with our development partners to provide the best solution. We're national. So we have the ability to work with multiple partners across the US, Canada, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. et cetera, in North America. So we have some end users that will come to us and say, hey, it was great working with you on this project in Atlanta, yep. but we'd like to look at a project in Seattle. Can you help yep. us out? So in that case, wow. we'll get involved pretty early. We'll go look for land with them and then we'll bring in and engage a contractor. We've obviously become very good friends with a lot of the general contractors. We find that ultimately a cohesive partnership with our partners leads to faster, more efficient execution. At the end of the day, we're making joint decisions. So yep. why not all sit at the table together on the front end and make sure the projects are set up for success. So mm -hmm. really we can start as early as we can go find a piece of land. We can sit and engage an architect and a contractor, really work on a design, try and find a building that meets your needs at a cost that makes sense for your business as an end user. Or as a development partner, we can come in sort of if you already have a building designed with an end user and it's all fleshed out, it's all ready to go. We can come in at that point sort of later in the game and say, yep, this fits our objectives. We're good to go. You know, we'll start writing checks. We'll close a loan and we'll build the thing. So our involvement really spans the spectrum. I think is given the nuances, as you guys know, and the technicalities of mm -hmm. as a thermal guy, right? Like making sure that the building's perfect is important. And so having people like Mike on our team as a layer of oversight for our partners, oh, yeah. just another set of eyes never hurts in this space. Yep. I've learned, yep. um, especially most of our partners and, you know, our contractors and subcontractors very open to collaboration and just best ideas win trying to make mm -hmm. sure that end user, whoever's going to occupy the building yeah. gets the best building that they can. So really trying to be collaborative and as helpful as we can. And then if we, if we need to stay out of the way, we stay out of the way. So, yeah. You made a, a comment about your developer partners. Are you open to letting us know who your developer partners are? Like, what does that term mean to someone that doesn't know anything about, you know, what we do? Yeah, no, happy to. I found this, this industry is very small, so there's not a lot of secrets and I'm a straight shooter. So, um, What's a developer look, partner? <laughs> so development partners are really, they're groups that typically, like I said, localize or have an area of expertise, a set of relationships that are differentiated. So our biggest one is a group called RL Cold out of Atlanta. We've built four projects with them. We have two more under construction. They really focus on, they've built a really special team from, you know, industry as well. They focus on helping being a turnkey solution for end yeah. users. They help find pallets. They help with P&Ls and sort of rate creation. And, you know, they help with startup costs and 
how to really put that box yeah. together. So yeah. great partner there. Like I mentioned, TI Cold, we've built two projects with them now. They were great for us. I think they were, Rob was our, and Sam was our first entree into the cold storage space. And they're they're beauties, by the way. Partner. Rob and Sam are Oh, fantastic. absolutely. Yeah. We got some funny Always. stories going back with those guys. <laughs> um, yeah, we do. So they're one of our great partners as well. And then we have a, a series of localized. We're doing stuff with a group called Crawford Hoying in Columbus. Very localized to Columbus. Yeah. Really strong development team. Great access to land. You know, mm -hmm. like I said, totally open to collaborate been a great partner for us uh, mm -hmm. and then we're building we're building some of the tri temp facilities uh for yeah. like the khees and the unfi yeah. so sure. those are more with localized partners that are less yep. specialized in cold they're more i would say their bread and butter is building mm -hmm. dry warehouses mm -hmm. but those sort of tri temp where it's about a third freezer cooler sometimes box in a box yep. no yep. big deal for them so I think, and then we have a big partnership with Saxum who has a partnership with Arcadia. So we have about sure. five assets with them. We're looking at more there. So it's awesome. Really across the portfolio, I think we have five or six unique partners and look, we're always looking for more, but we're looking for people that, you know, are really focused on the space because it's, mm -hmm. it can be challenging and you can mm -hmm. stub your toe pretty bad if you don't know oh, what yeah. you're doing. <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's some big names and, and obviously you guys are well taken care of with those names there. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Very right. much so when you're working with these partners in terms of location, like, and, and maybe it can, this question could go a variety of different ways, but like, how do you determine like the locations like that, that you're picking? Is it like the development partners bring it in? Or are you guys picking the locations? Are you seeing a trend of where the locations should be in terms of these types of buildings that where the need is? What are you seeing? In yeah, no, it's like a really good location? question. Jenna. I would say there's three different ways. One is end users. They just know where they need to be and, and we just go help them be there. So that's one, that's the easiest one. Mm -hmm. Number two is what you said. Development partners have a localized expertise in a market. They're really pounding the pavement on the pallets. They're talking to the manufacturers and really understanding, Hey, you know, X manufacturers looking to reconfigure their supply chain. They need a position in this market. It'll be super strategic. They'll cut transportation costs. So that's one way in an example. And then at a top down level, we've built out um, BGO, obviously a large investment manager. We have a pretty robust database that we leverage that tracks sort of every food manufacturer in the US, what they're producing, every cold storage building in the US, average age, sort of tenancy. And then we're looking at sort of labor demographics, things like that. And so marrying all that together with port data and some transportation data. You can come up with some pretty heat mappy type uh, spots where it's, you know, hey, there hasn't been a building built here in in 17 years and the population's grown by 10% annually and mm -hmm. buildings are 55 years old and, you know, it's a rapidly growing distribution hub that's sort of evolved with transportation patterns and there's great labor so people can maintain costs and really operate an efficient building and ultimately be profitable. So then we could say, Hey, development partner, you cover the Southeast. We really think, you know, Jacksonville is a great market. You know, they're yeah, investing sure. in the port, et cetera. So kind of three different ways. Yeah. No one's better or worse, but kind of got to come at it from a lot of different angles. And then we sort of stress test all of that. At a high level, we are real estate investors, right? So we right. have to make sure that that market or location is something that we think ultimately we could sell and will be attractive to a to another buyer. So we have to bring that lens too. at the end of the day. It, it might really work for food and infrastructure and that, but it might not work from a institutional sort of investment perspective. So mm -hmm. that's the, that's the portfolio management side of the investing uh, piece. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So I think you kind of landed the plane on that, that I was going to ask another question, but I think you kind of landed the plane. So if it's a a repeat question has a lot to do with what Jenna just asked as far as determining locations and, and whatnot. But I mean, how do you assess the viability and potential return on investment for a cold storage project? Yeah, good question. Development's obviously challenging. So there's a lot of risks with it, as you know, managing contractors and managing subcontractors. And, you know, we had a we had a crazy last couple of years, obviously, with materials and the like. So, you know, everybody's world was flipped upside down. But we have obviously really complicated financial models that will tell us, you know, based on our best predictions, really what this asset right. is going to generate from a, right. all of our investors look at it. And we're measured on our performance on an internal rate of return, which is basically just a calculation of an annualized return, similar if you're mm -hmm. buying a stock or a bond. Sure. But really, really the 
key way to think about it for the, you know, the simplest way and how I explain it to my parents is how much money are, is the tenant going to pay in rent versus how much does it cost? So that's what we call our return on cost, our initial starting place that's fixed. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And then your variable there is the budget. You know, if we miss mm -hmm. the budget materially, obviously our return on that cost is, is hampered pretty, pretty, pretty bad. And then there's the, when you sell it, what can you sell it for? So what if I was a buyer, what would I pay for that income stream? You know, sure. is that, is that a 5%, you know, income stream? Is that a really, really weird location, mm -hmm. really specialized building? I need to get paid a little more. Is that a 7% income stream? So the difference between what you can build it for and what you can sell it for, we call that the development spread. So if you can build it for an eight and sell it for a five, you're going to make a shitload of money. Yep. Build it for a seven and sell it for a six and a half. You're going to do okay, but you're not going to hit your return target. So those sure. are the, the simplest way to do it. There's a lot of yep. noise in between. Oh, yeah. There's a lot sure. of scenarios and models and 50 tabs and oh, yeah. thousands we'll, of calculations. We'll send me your spreadsheet, man. Send me your Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> I'll send yeah. you the one for dummies. <laughs> yeah. Please, please. That's the one we need. <laughs> please do. I mean, well, everyone's asking this question too, because I mean, obviously we are in an election year, 2024. Everyone is very, everything's polarized and everyone's very divided and everyone's very nervous about this year. And, and without going down that rabbit hole, because it is a rabbit hole in today's market. I mean, what concerns do you have when it comes to the cold storage market right now this year? I mean, I would say from my perspective, what concerns me is, is costs have sort of gone to all time highs. And then on our side, you know, part of how we think about return is what are interest rates and interest rates went from zero to for the 10 year today is that like 4.3%. So you went from a 1% to a 4.3% 10 year, which has put a lot of pressure on, what we need to return, which in turn returns to what we need end users to pay in rent. So I think rents are at an all time high across the industry. And that's putting a lot of pressure on end users. I think we feel it, we talk to them, and we understand that piece of it. And then the election year adds a whole different wrinkle into it is what's going to happen with interest rates. If interest rates keep going up, then, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. rates have to go up, rents have to go up. And then at some point it's just untenable, you know, mm -hmm. not every, you can't just, trees don't grow to the sky. So you can't, you can't just pay rents, you know, right. when you were paying 10 bucks a foot and you're paying 30 bucks a foot today, it just doesn't right. work. At least I don't want it to work. Cause then I go right. to the grocery store and my eggs cost $30 and so I'm, much. <laughs> You know what I mean? So I don't you see it, that. right? It's oh, that's the yeah. cool part we about do. it. It's real. Like you see, we do the, see it. Okay, we're you see the consequences of it, but we can't control it, right? So that's my biggest fear is just the volatility in interest rates. The the election adds just a layer of volatility to that mm -hmm. space, and then the pressure it's putting on rates and things like that for yeah. end users, right? You know, we would need a, our end users to be successful for us to be successful, and we mm -hmm. need our partners to be successful and. Yep. It's hard to model sort of interest rates because, you know, we have an economist, but everybody, every good economist will tell you they have no clue what's going to happen with interest rates. You just can't predict it. So right. that's, that's the monkey yeah. in the room. It has been yeah. for a couple of years in our world, but it's only further amplified with an election year and it, yeah. just the uncertainty. We had an economist at the last GCCA speak. Were yeah. you there for that? And, yeah. he, and, and he was talking a lot about how we are going to become you know, the world's largest import of food because, you know, we were a large exporter, but we're turning into it. We're importing the food now. That's that's what he projects. Right. And and the main water source in the Midwest is drying up and he's just going down all these rabbit holes and he's scaring people. And, you know, and I'm just like, man, I don't know if I'm buying all this, man. How do you feel about his talk? I don't know if I'm buying all that either. The water thing is pretty interesting. I mean, we've been studying that a little bit internally. I think that's mm -hmm. a 50 to 100 year trend. And I I believe in innovation. You look at America, we innovate like crazy. I think we'll yeah. find solutions, whether that's, you know, new refrigeration systems that use less water, right? Like there's ways around that, oh, yeah. I think, for the cold storage industry. So I'm, I'm not too worried about that myself. I, and I think the import story, look, there's certain things that we will be net importers of, but I think yeah. we study a lot and look at sort of export trends. We're ex you look at protein exports to the Middle East and to, oh, yeah. to Asia. We're the only region in the world that has the amount of arable land needed to sort of raise real livestock and things mm -hmm. like that, right? So 
we're going to continue to export that rising middle class in Asia and the Middle East. They're going to start to eat more proteins, chicken export. You're, you're seeing that like crazy in the Southeast and sort of flowing yeah. through our facilities in yeah. Charleston and Jacksonville. And look, I mean, if you go, I uh, have a friend that's actually a, he's a meat trader. He sent me a video in, in Asia that they have pigs up in office buildings. Like that's how they have to raise them. Right. So wow. I think that's not going to, that's, that has so much virus risk and food oh, security. Yeah. We're going to yeah. have to continue to send product. They're just landlocked, right? And they yeah. don't have the land to mm-hmm. raise. So I, I think, look, I think we'll be continue to be exporters of certain commodities. There's things we'll always yeah. be importers of, I think. Yeah. But we're, I think we're pretty, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on America. Yeah. I think we're still the best, you know, all things considered, all our flaws. Yeah. We have it pretty good here. Money question, you know, so how long does it take? And you might not know the answer to this. I don't know the answer to this, but maybe you do. So you know, the cost of borrowing money is more expensive. The cost of concrete is more expensive. IMP is more expensive. Steel is more expensive. I know, right? (laughs) Well, (laughs) no comment. No. (laughs) Well, he has to buy drinks for everyone at the bar. So he's got to sell his concrete for more. (laughs) Correct. His following is getting too big for his bills. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, at what point, does a $20 million building that now takes $30 million, at what point do you see that in their grocery store, that that cost increase reflect the cost of goods that you're buying in the grocery store? How long does that take till you start seeing it? A normal person not in our industry will see that increase. It's a tough question. I think it's, it's definitely a a material lag because obviously the time it takes to build these buildings yeah. and yeah. that's just one building of the entire supply chain. Yeah. So if you look yeah. at, we study on the freezer side, there's 250 million square feet, plus or minus. I think there's yeah. been 10 million that's been built over the last two years. That'll be sort of at that new peak. So they mm-hmm. blend that across the industry. So I think it's, you know, I think for the entire food supply chain to be reset, that's a, you know, a 20 year cycle. But yeah. I think you're seeing it in the grocery store, not just at the, at the you know, because of the cost of the building, I think labor has gone up materially, which is a big input factor for Mm -hmm. a lot of the operators. So I think rates, if you look at public refrigerated rates, and some of them are published with like a miracle being a publicly traded company, right? They're at all time highs. So I think it's a combination of new buildings and then the input costs as well, labor, utilities. What's the uh, cost to move the food, uh, gas prices, transportation, all that stuff plays a part of it, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, The building's just one small component. I mean, it's a big component, but it's of the overall supply chain. It's not the biggest. Considering all of this, there's a lot of unknowns, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. But considering considering that, do you see the demand for facilities like this changing? Like the facilities that we build, do you see the demand changing anytime soon? It's a really good question. And and if I really knew the answer, I probably would be not working uh, for much longer. <laughs> so if you figure it out, let me know. Yeah. Okay, but look, my, pers- my perspective is, in, and being in the market with a lot of users and a lot of buildings, I think we're seeing a slowdown. We're th- seeing groups think twice about taking space that they might have two years ago, just grabbed it and said, you know, I need it, right? Yeah. They're really looking at their total costs, their total supply chain, how can they gain efficiencies? How can they leverage their existing network? Where do they want to leverage a new 3PL? Where do they want to store product directly themselves? So I think you're seeing a a demand just take a deep breath. I think for a while people were grabbing space and going crazy. And now we're sort of seeing a, all right, let's think about this. And Mm -hmm. I think the unique perspective that we have is that we look at investing across all different asset types. So industrial yeah. hotels, office buildings, shopping malls, right? And mm-hmm. I think we still are really bullish on the supply demand of cold storage because there's a lot being built, but on a relative scale, if you look at other asset classes, it's a fraction and a lot of it's isolated in certain markets. So it's still really hard to build these. It's still really hard for groups that you know want space to finance them themselves now, given how high costs have gone. So I'm still bullish on sort of the long-term fundamentals, but I think we're in a year of, you know, and and these companies too, if you look into their C-suites, they're worried about the election and what's going to happen with interest yeah. rates and volatility and because they're running a whole business, right? So mm-hmm. I think it's a it's going to be a year of 
sort of choppiness and sort of uncertainty. And but I think long term, you know, the next 12 to 36 months, I'm still pretty bullish on same sort of overall fundamentals. Same. Yeah. yeah. For someone new or, or, you know, we're getting a lot of young bucks joining our industry, which I love. I mean, what kind of advice would you give developers, someone new in the industry, an entrepreneur seeking financing for a cold storage project? And I would just say, be, be humble, be respectful, be open. I think my favorite part about the industry is how you treat people the right way, which I think everybody in the existing, I would say that the legacy industry, mm -hmm. one of the things I love the most about it is how people treat each other, how family oriented. I mean, yeah. just sitting here on a podcast with you two, right? Yeah. And I've never been to a real estate conference where there's spouses at a luau in Scottsdale <laughs> and I'm meeting wives and drinking yeah. and having a blast, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you need to be open. You need to immerse yourself. You need to be humble. And yeah. there's enormous amount of resources and people that will help educate you and help you avoid mistakes, but you need to be very grateful. You need to be yourself. You need to be real. You need to be raw. You need to admit you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. And then you're going to be welcomed with open arms and be a good person. There's a lot of people I think that come from finance or private equity that can rub people the wrong way because we, our, our world is different. Our yeah. business is different. And if you treat people with a financial lens that they don't know what the hell they're talking about, which Vince, you don't know how to run a spreadsheet like me, but that's okay, right? I don't know how I to build know. a building like you. So if we're all if we're all coming at it from that place, it's a good place. But I think there's yeah. people that come at and look down on the industry because it's it's just different. It's a yeah. it's a different set of uh, stakeholders that really drive value. And we found that early that it's it's all the way down to the subs and the GCs that are really driving and have a lot of control mm -hmm. over the outcome of our investment. So we need to treat them as if they're our most important clients, as well as our end users, as well as our investors, right? So yeah. just be open, honest, and take advantage of the resources and the education that's available because it's plentiful, which I think is also unique. There's not a lot of other industries that are as as open and as honest with sort of challenges and solutions and how to think about things and how to design and where the industry could be going. And so I think it's a great industry from that perspective, but you got to be you got to be humble when you, when you come sure. in, because, you know, there's a lot of people that have been in it for their entire lives, third generation, lives. right? You yeah. know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, speaking, talking about the industry and like your experience in it, can I ask you, this is one of our sponsored moments from our sponsors at VersaFoam and Vapor Armor today. Do you have a cool story or a cool moment about your experience of maybe they're coming into this industry or or a funny moment that happened, you know, at one of these. A Brett, know, a Brett wedding story a Brett wedding you can share. Story you share. <laughs> That's okay. To I don't share. know if I'm allowed to name names, but <laughs> I'm going to name them anyway, just because <laughs> it's it's kind of one that really, in my mind, when I, you know, I, I was thinking about <laughs> what's a cool moment. Well, the one that I always remember is it was the pandemic and we were working on our first project with Rob and Sam down in Phoenix. We went down for a tour, you know, this is um, six months into really focusing on the space. So I've been a sponge. I've been learning as yeah. much as I could, asking every, anybody that would talk to us. We formed a partnership with Rob and Sam, obviously a wealth of knowledge. But we go down to Phoenix and we were with the brands, Greg and uh, Justin. Um, Noram was looking at our building potentially at the time. So we drive out to the job site. I'm with Rob and Logan. We're shooting the shit in the van and Greg and Justin are in their, you know, their excursion and we go from a JBS plant to this job site and we look at the site, it's just dirt, right? There's nothing to see, but we say, you know, this is what it's going to be. And, and uh, we're going back to the hotel and, and Greg goes, Hey, you, and I'm like me, he goes, get in the car. And I'm like, okay. And everyone's kind of like just him. And he's like, yeah, just him. <laughs> so I jump in this is his excursion. And I forget the exact words he said, but it was something to the effect of like, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> and I was like, Who's this guy, you know, CEO, like I said, you know, built oh, yeah. a business, you know, on his, yeah. you know, and really cool. We had a great chat about how he built that business from nothing and what mm -hmm. it is today and mm -hmm. extremely yeah. impressive. But, you know, he was sort of, as you guys are asking these questions, he's like, what the hell is money doing, you know, in this business? So for me, that was just a, it was one of my, I'll never forget, you know, <laughs> the guy grabs me and says, you're getting in my car and just starts <laughs> grilling me for we had a 45 minute drive. So it was 15 minutes of him asking a lot of questions and yeah. and then it really was 30 minutes of just awesome, you know, that's his awesome. experience in the industry and all that. So mm -hmm. that's probably my coolest sort of he, entry yeah. moment where I really yeah. felt like, all right, I start to 
understand it all and how it works. Brants are great. The Norham's awesome. I golfed with him and he's one of my favorite Cowboys, man, but that guy hits a mean slice and he hit someone one time <laughs> on the next <laughs> tee box. I'm like, bro, you better control that slice. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. Uh, it was a funny, character. Man. No, that was at an event, man. It was wild. It's like, you know, not every day you see someone get nailed with a golf ball, but man. Yeah. yeah he's a, he's a great dude. So many good stories. I mean, even with Sam and uh, Rob, I mean, those guys are, are characters and, you know, great friends of ours. And we've had Sam on the show and mm -hmm. yeah, Sam's a beauty, man. He's yeah. the people, the people and the personalities bring a level of fun to this industry that. Oh, it's amazing is just so fun to be yeah. a part of we were pretty new in the industry jen and i in in regards to like new in the industry in regards to like doing our own thing if yeah. you will you know starting freeze and but i remember at a seba conference we we ended up having dinner with sam and misty and and uh six bottles of camus later we all became very 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 good friends very good friends yeah <laughs> Sam loves his wine. We had a, oh yeah. it was the first time we were meeting them was in 2020, the pandemic. We were in Chicago, complete lockdown, right? Couldn't oh, even yeah. eat at a restaurant. We had eight people. Mm -hmm. We somehow got a private room at, um, I, forget what, I think it was Soho house or something. And we, that was the only place we could take our masks off. But Sam doesn't like those things. And we ran them out of wine. They're like, we're, we don't have any more wine. Oh <laughs> like the, you, know, you have to yeah. go to another room. So we ended up in a hotel room that had, you know, little mini bottles of wine. Oh, that's Next awesome. Thing you know, it's two in the morning and we're like, okay, we get it. And Dude, that that's... was the start of the partnership. You know, yep. but Sam, uh, Sam is a man. Yes. We all yeah, have a lot. That's funny. A lot of funny stories happen over wine. And, and one of my other favorite stories in the industry is I'm not sure if you ever heard the name Connor Lowry ever before, but Connor Lowry was one of the founders of TrueCore Insulated Metal Panels, that the panel manufacturer company that started in Lawrence, South Carolina, that Nucor ended up buying. But before that, his Got dad, it. you know, his dad had a long history, you know, building IMP manufacturer company, started All Weather. Connor worked for All Weather for a long time, then started TrueCore with Dean and Sarah. But anyways, we had Luke Waite. Do you remember, do you know Luke Waite, one of our PMs? I've heard the name, but I don't, I, beard. oh, yeah. oh no, yeah, yeah, I have, I have guy, yeah, 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 I met him in Atlanta. <laughs> and uh, Dan Costello, and at the time he was at All Weather with Connor and Luke and I were in a hotel room and, and just like, you know, in Chicago, I think that was the first trip I met Brett Wedding at, but we're drinking the the little wine bottles that were in the hotel room uh, <laughs> yeah. because the bar is like closed early or something. And, and, and Connor and Luke got in a huge argument about insulin metal panels. And at the time Luke worked for ESI and Luke was a GC. So he didn't care about panels. He said, a panel is a panel. It doesn't matter who makes it. He goes, it's all the same. And he was like, so matter of fact, it was all the same. So, you know, Connor and Dan are like, you know, are, are offended because they're like, well, here's why our panel is better because blah, blah, blah. So I'm sitting there laughing hysterical because they are like ready to like throw down fighting over a product. <laughs> and now that, and now that Luke works with us and, and now Dan works with us, we tease Luke about all the time because now Luke is the one being like a panel is not a panel. And here's why. And, and cause he has to live with it now. <laughs> he has to buy him and live with it. And, and yeah. he's like, yeah. he is now like, all right, I, I, he's kind of swallowing. His yeah, head. he took that back. Yeah, but, and yeah, dude, it was it was a that's drunken good. night of of red wine arguments about panels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's the same night I met Brett Wedding. Yes. Yeah, I won't go to that story. That's that was a good one. That's worst night ever. Probably. We, should, we, should... <laughs> <laughs> we save that for the next time Brett yeah, comes back. We will save that story for the next one. Uh, well, my guy, how can uh, how can our entire industry find Will Nelson online? Do you do you have a do you want to share an email or a social media handle or do you want to uh, or link, BGO or LinkedIn? BGO. Where do they uh, find more information BG, about B, what BGO? Yeah, is doing? BGO. How do we find BGO or you? Yeah, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, William Nelson. Email. Don't hesitate to reach out. Will Nelson. N e l s o n at BGO dot com. BGO dot com is our website. We're actually working on uh, rolling out a BGO cold storage website specifically for industry uh, to cool. show sort of yeah. what we can do, I think, uh, across the space. So 
we'll stay tuned for that. I'll make sure and uh, post that when it's available. I think probably in the next month or two. Wow. Always happy to chat. You know, if any of the listeners, you know, if anybody wants to just ask follow up, you know, I'm grateful for what the industry has given me in education. I'm always happy to chat on, you know, if you have questions and it's not a deal that we're, you need any help on, I'm happy to sort of advise, answer any questions because it's complicated our world yeah. to some and, and your world is complicated to me. So I find that you give, give what you get. So I'm yeah. definitely a believer in paying it back. So don't hesitate to reach out. I mean that and happy to answer any other questions, but really appreciate it guys. It's been great. We always ask our guests. So Will, what is your favorite trade show or in conference. our industry? You go to so many conferences. What's my your shameless one? plug no. is the, is I like the icon one because it's the, it's the blend of my, uh -huh. more of my world with the yeah. GCCA mm -hmm. world. Yeah. That one's fun for me because I yeah. think it's, you know, like I really appreciated your all, you know, participation last year. I, I think it's great for the industries to sort of keep coming together. I think yeah. the more information yeah. flow, the more participants, the bigger, the better, Mm -hmm. Everybody wins. I'm a believer in rising tide lifts all boats. So Absolutely. I love that one. I love the GCCA. I'm going to bring Sarah to one of them because she doesn't believe that other wives and significant <laughs> others go, but I want, mm -hmm. I want her to see the world and the party. Yes, um, bring her. So Sarah, right. please come. Please come, Sarah. Sarah, please yeah. come. Yeah, so that that's my favorite sort of cold storage specific one. Icon's a great show, by the way. Yeah, they did a great yeah, job. Yeah, you did a you great know, job. You yeah. did a great job on stage, mm -hmm. by the way. Your talk was awesome. As did you. And I appreciate that. And anybody that has, that was at that or wants to learn more, reach out. And then also if you have ideas on how we can make that show better, yeah, please do. Yeah. I think yeah. we're, we might be doing Vegas. Uh, I think we're looking at that. So is it know, Vegas this year? Bad. That's not I, bad. I think we're working on it. <laughs> I heard Atlanta, we'll Dallas, or I, I heard only those two. I didn't know Vegas is on the table. Are you on the board? It's a, or are you, it's do you a help late with entry. That? Do you help with that? Conference I do. Yeah. I help a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Very cool. Well, I, I want to get to the fun final round of the rapid round, this or that questions to learn more about you. I'm sure you've heard this part of the, the show. Are you comfortable and ready for this? I'm ready. Okay. I'm going to start you with some softball questions. Okay. <laughs> Let's go. All right, dude. Pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. Okay. Would you rather always smell like garlic or always smell like onions? Garlic. Have a permanent unibrow or no eyebrows at all? Oof. I think no. I think I could look good with no. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd go no eyebrows too. <laughs> live without music or live without TV? TV. Mm. Woo. Mm -hmm. Be constantly itchy or constantly sticky? <laughs> Jeez. Sticky. <laughs> Only be able to use a spoon with no fork or only be able to use a fork and never a spoon. I think you need a fork. Wear shoes that are slightly too large or one size too small. Too large. Invisibility or able to fly. Fly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's the I less, like it. that's the less creepy of the, the answers, by the way. I just want to tell you that. <laughs> All right. Are you do? Are you into a box and box projects or a ground up project? Ground up. Ping pong or air hockey? Air hockey. Beach side or a poolside guy? Poolside. Justin Timberlake or Justin Bieber? Biebs. Biebs. You got a lot of Biebs this year in 2020. I'm a believer. Yeah, dude. New JT music this I year. I love it. Just Sorry, saying. people aren't ready for it. Yeah, it's you the JT guy. Trains. I'm a big JT big guy. Big JT yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I might be going to three like or four that. of his concerts this year. You might be. <laughs> I like well. that. Yeah. yeah. That's That'd awesome, my guy. Yeah. Well, do Will, you're a stud. Thank you so much for your time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for all the listeners out there, and make sure Sarah knows this too, so she can listen to this <laughs> on her phone, Spotify. We are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Listen to it whenever you want. Play it back subscribe help us out share spread the love you can watch our goofy faces and interactions on youtube so we have a youtube channel as well yes. and uh yeah man no dude you're a stud versa foam versa foam vapor yes, armor thank, thank you guys. guys so much you guys make this happen and will you're a stud i look forward to seeing you soon my guy all right yeah thank you both really appreciate the time and this was great so thanks for doing this yeah. keep on doing it too it's awesome thank you yeah thank dude. you
until next time, my guys, I appreciate you all. And uh, we'll chat soon. Mm -hmm.